my name is Morgan Levy, and uh, my first magic trick, you can see how my fingers are I'm no longer practicing. I got multiple sclerosis, and so I had to forcibly retire. So I don't get to do all of my uh, speaking and engagements that I used to do. But I'm financially secure because I had good uh, disability insurance. However, I'd like to do some speaking engagements. For the last few years, I've been developing a website uh, for the purpose of hopefully uh, getting some speaking engagements. You can't pay me, so I speak for free. Because if you pay me, then they take it away from my disability. So. If you like what you see and you have a group that you want me to talk to, uh, I'm more than willing to come and talk to your group. And this is the wet boot. God, that looks horrible. <laughs> <laughs> what happened between there and here? <laughs> well, I don't I know. Can <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, this isn't exactly what it looks like on the real computer screen, but uh, it's close. But in any case, um, this is my website. And, you know, believe me, the. Uh, the aesthetics of it are a lot better when you actually see it on the on your computer. In, in any case, the topic I was going to talk about today was the all my topics are the neuroscience of whatever. I was going to talk about the neuroscience of religious behavior. However, uh, my good friends Brian and Baxter decided for the first time to talk about complementary and alternative medicine today. So I thought I would just switch and follow that up. So. Um, Rather than talking about neuroscience of religious behavior, I'm going to talk about the neuroscience of the placebo effect. And so I think that's going to tuck in nicely to what they were saying. And uh, at the end of their talk, when I was trying to say something, well, then now I'm going to continue. <laughs> <laughs> in any case, um, if you go to my website, and to get to my website, you can just put Morgan Levy MD, all one, you know, all one word, Morgan Levy MD, into your search, and you'll, you'll bring up my website. I've got five online free books you can read. You'll notice that number three is placebo medicine, and that's the one we're going to kind of focus on today. Um, I was going to focus on me of a little more or less faith, which is about religion. Or you can go into talks. So actually right now, um, why don't you go in for just a second to me of a little more or less faith. So this is, this is the, that, the book about, I wrote about religion, and that's why I'm talking about the neuroscience of um, religious behavior. Okay, um, go back to home. Um, now uh, go to number three, placebo effect. So this is an earlier book I had written about the placebo effect. And so this is the one we're going to mostly talk about today. Okay, you can go back to home. Now go to talks. Oh, this is working great. I don't even have to mouse. <laughs> um, down here in the speaking, go to talks. Yeah. So you can see I was originally going to do the neuroscience of religious behavior, which is about a 10 minute video, uh, a clip, and there's uh, 10 three minute um, clips afterwards answering uh, uh, questions that people had asked from the initial thing. So you can go on here and you can, you can see the entire presentation online if you want. So what we're going to do today then instead is go to the neuroscience of the placebo effect. Okay, so go ahead and do that. And the neuro not, not that, oh, yeah. you know what, I forgot about that. Yeah, now that's an old procedure effect. Yeah, that one right there. Yeah. Oh, man, can we switch this? Can we a little bit off? Yeah. All right, no, that's totally good. That's, that's totally good enough, yeah. Any way you can make that full screen? Let me, let me pause it. Uh, let's see. Yeah, right. yeah there you go. I think this right here, yeah. Okay. All right, this is like an eight minute thing, and when it's done, then I'm just going to do question and answer.
Any questions? <laughs> so you seem to be suggesting that instead of people selling these uh, disco coffins, things like this, you actually have actually trained people who are just walking you through creating endorphins and different chemicals to help to help yourself in certain certain ways. Is that where you could be heading with that? Um, I'm, not, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> could there be a legitimate science instead of having all this crap pseudoscience? Could you just have? Oh right, right. No, that's actually my, that is my whole idea in, in, in a nutshell. I mean, um, I would I would like to promote a, the use of placebo in real medicine. It, it used to be used all the time. But back in like the fifties or sixties, somewhere in there, um, they passed a rule that you doctors can't use placebo pills. And since then, doctors have sort of lost the ability to use placebo in regular medicine. And I think it's a huge loss. I think it's a very potent and very good therapy, right? But obviously, um, you can't deceive patients and you can't, uh, you know, paternalism can't get out of hand and you can't, you know, there's all these, you know, all these other factors involved and everything. But, but if, if you could somehow you know, get placebo medicine back into regular medicine, that would be great. I, I just, you know, I, I'm just tooting my horn and I absolutely don't think that that's a realistic possibility and I'm not really trying to promote that, but I'm just talking about it as something to think about really. But but, but it would be cool if you could. Is that a good answer? <laughs> so as a neuroscientist, um, the, the actual physiological effect, is there some kind of uh, endorphins being released or, or whatnot? Uh, various things, and it's, it's caused by thinking about it. So to build on what Ari is saying, could you have a course where you would learn how to cause your brain to release endorphins? Oh yeah, no, that's extremely easy to do. Um, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm actually a board certified, not really, um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a clinical hypnotist. I actually am, but I mean, I don't really believe that they're boards or boards, but I did do the course, I'm technically board certified. Are you making a claim? I mean, you could come up and, or, you know, or, or, I can um, uh, do some, some clinical hypnosis, put you in a, just a mild, light state of trance, um, you know, uh, relax, focus, you know, focus your attention and get in a light state of trance and suggest to you that your arm could become numb and then I could stick a, a needle in there and your arm and it would, in, you know, would indeed be numb and stuff, you know. And, and, and even afterwards, you know, your arm would stay numb for a little bit of time before it went away. You know, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways to easily induce analgesia. Question. But yeah. can you do it to yourself? Yeah. Yeah, you can totally practice it. You can do it to yourself. Yoga. Yeah, absolutely. Yoga, you know, whatever, yeah. I mean, you can do it to the extent, for example, that um, on occasion when people can't tolerate uh, uh, um, sedatives and they need, like, open-heart surgery, um, they just practice for like several months doing hypnosis, and the patient gets really, really good at it, and um, they're able to be to undergo open heart surgery just under hypnosis, hypnotic analgesia with no, with no physiological analgesia. Yeah. It's a, a common observation that a uh, patient's chance of recovery from a serious condition. Uh, it's frequently dependent upon their will to live, uh, their own desire to live, that they, so they can give up, as it were, even though they're not being asked to do anything. But on the other, some, you know, observe that they have a, a will to live, they fight, they recover, somehow. Uh, and so is this the patient willing his own uh, uh, Endorphins or whatever. Right. And, and what here's, here's how I would conceptualize that issue. And, and you know, as I was saying, that um, in regular medicine, we sort of lost the ability to do the placebo effect. But well, the placebo effect also involved a lot of paternalistic, you know, caretaking from other part of the physicians. We've lost a lot of that too. You know, we've, the doctors mostly just, you know, stick you with needles and push buttons and stuff nowadays, right? So I, I think doctors are kind of now, in the last 10 years or so, a lot of medical schools are really focusing on teaching doctors to be doctors again. And I think that's a you know, good thing because one of the biggest, best things you do as a doctor is instill a positive you know, mental attitude in your patient to want to get well and stuff. But all of these types of things 
don't treat underlying illness. All they do is trigger compensatory mechanisms. So for example, if you have a broke, if I actually broke my leg, well, it would be nice if I could trigger some compensatory endorphins, right? But there's nothing I can do just by being a good doctor to you to actually cause the bone, you know, to grow back together, right? But how about you recover from paralysis? I can help you recover from paralysis because there's a number of things that your body can do in a compensatory fashion that can help you feel, you know, get sleep at night or, you know, less pain or, you know, things like that. Uh, for example, um, the inflammatory response. I can, through hypnosis, cause you to have an inflammatory response on your arm. You know, just because I can get the correct neurotransmitters to cause an inflammatory response. Can I cure a cancer that's on your arm? No. Does that make, kind of make sense? So I think it's important for doctors to make best use of their patient's compensatory abilities by you know, acting appropriately and, and being compassionate, being an authority figure, doing you know, all of the doctor-patient relationship stuff to get, them, to, them, to get your patient to maximize their own body's compensatory mechanisms, but un you have to understand those don't actually treat disease. Does that make sense? I'm not familiar with that word, compensatory. Uh, com compensatory means, um, um, anybody say a good d definition of that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it compensates. It's like, um, yeah, you know, if you're in pain and you take a morphine, that compensates for the pain. Yeah. Brain plasticity is limited. There's other reasons to take it, too. Yeah. 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 We've got a paranormal investigator with that question. Okay, I just want to make sure I know Orson was talking so. Um, I, I just kind of want to bring up that a lot of people don't think about the flip side of this as well. Uh, people get something known as failure to thrive. Um, there was a six, I think she was six years old uh, little girl, and she went in uh, for some tests and everything. And uh, they found out she, had, uh, she was diabetic. And they didn't talk to her a whole lot about it, but all of a sudden her, felt, her health just die bombed. She started getting really sick, and it was just doing really bad. And then finally it took one of the doctors asking her what was wrong. And she said, well, I'm going to diabetes. Oh, <laughs> and once they got that straightened out, she, her health took a turn. But so the opposite effect happens as well. Well, my actual profession is that I'm a geriatric psychiatrist. I'm an Alzheimer's disease researcher. And so one of the things that we learn how to do is deal with terminal illness in old people. And you know, there are several different ways you can do that. You can just say, hey, you're going to die. <laughs> you know, or I, I think a, a, a more helpful way to do it would be, you know what, you've lived a really long life, and I'm telling you now that you, there's just a few months left to go. Now it is incumbent upon you. You have a large family, you have a wife, and you need to teach them how to deal with this. And you need to, um, you need to take them on this journey, because this is what's going to be happening to you in the near future. You know, that's a whole lot more positive message than, oh, you're going to die in a few months, you know. So I, you, 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 as a doctor, you know, yeah, we've got a huge armamentarium of powerful medicines and stuff we can use nowadays, but I think back before we had all those medicines, when doctors were real doctors, you know, we, you know, we, can, we can get a lot of that stuff back and be really real doctors again, too, and help, you know, kids, you know, <laughs> understand stuff a little more accurately. Do you know anything about the placebo effect in animals? I've, I've heard that it does work. Yeah, you know, I would, I, it's impossible to know the answer. And I, I've, said, I've actually read studies about placebo <coughs> effects in animals. I am almost 100% certain that they all fall into categories one through five, which is misperception. I would, I would, I would find it difficult to believe that a, um, you know, that you did one of these um, non-pharmacological interventions. Like However, you know, I think that you know, if you yell at your dog and he whimpers away, you've done a non-pharmacological intervention that has made him feel bad, right? <laughs> so you can still do that mechanism, but can that mechanism result in analgesia? I find I, I just find it really hard to believe you could do that with a dog. But well, you need is a pet psychic to. <laughs> 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 Why not? If, if animals uh, have morale, which they do, uh, and if morale is affecting the ability of people to recover from disease, 
why would you affect it in animals? Well, the, the issue is uh, whether or not they're able to follow suggestion. So just like how difficult it is with a small child, I mean, the more educated and intelligent you are, the easier I can get you to follow direction and follow suggestion and stuff. And I just don't know how you're going to do that with dogs. Maybe there's a way to do that. I just, you know, I, I don't know. Find really smart dogs. <laughs> my wife says I'm a really smart dog. <laughs> <laughs> I took my dog to the pet club. It doesn't absolutely doesn't matter. It's all the suggestion is. What matters is how you perform the suggestion. You know, uh, so for example, you know, um, I, I could, the suggestion could be something that's just ridiculous, right? And, but if I, if it's the manner in which I do the doctor-patient relationship that makes the suggestion work or not, like I could totally tell you, this is a fake treatment. But if I present that in the right way, you know, there's still analgesia. Was there the, like, if you have, a, if you give somebody gel tab versus a, sugar pill versus a fake injection, the more um, so the major yeah. the uh, uh, intervention <coughs> seems, the better the placebo. Guess which one works the best? Could you repeat yeah. the question? <laughs> and the question is, are there gradations of different placebos that work to a greater or lesser extent? And absolutely, you know, a, a red pill works, you know, best for um, uh, depression. A green, a blue pill works best for anxiety. Um, you know, uh, needles work better than pills. Um, bad tasting pills work better than good. Big bad tasting pills. <laughs> <laughs> what about suppositories? <laughs> It depends on who and who does it. <laughs> what color is the I'm interested in the. You say there's a, a histamine response with, with placebos, which I suppose you mean, or there would be an antihistamine reaction to that. Uh, biologically or evolutionary speaking, does that make any sense? Yes, yeah. in fact, you could take an antihistamine and actually, if you were doing hypnotically induced histamine response in your skin, yeah. you took an antihistamine before doing that, the, the, the hypnotically induced response wouldn't happen. Um, and here's another example with, uh, you know, um, with, uh, with endorphins and analgesia. Has anybody ever heard of a nocebo? Uh, yeah. It's exactly the opposite of a placebo. A nocebo is when you want to actually induce pain. And you can, it works exactly the same. Way. You, you, you can, you can uh, hypnotically cause their arm to be like, feel like it's on fire, and they'll be running around going ah. <laughs> you, know, so you can everything you can do with placebo, you can do opposite with nocebo. And, and interestingly, through functional imaging, you, uh, it's really been well demonstrated now that um, if you look at a functional image of somebody who has taken morphine and somebody who's just got hypnotically induced analgesia. The same parts of the brain are lighting up, and these are the parts of the brain that are involved in pain reduction. Of course, with the medicine, you can get a whole lot more stuff lighted. With the hypnotic suggestion, it's a lot more specific, just the pain centers. But, but you see those light up, and then if you take a, uh, um, uh, what's the medicine that's it reducing uh, the endorphin? Um, naloxone. You take naloxone, which is what you give somebody who comes in who's about to die from uh, opioid, opioid uh, um, overdose. You give them naloxone, it completely eliminates the effects of the opioids. So you give someone naloxone, and it completely it, it eliminates the effect of the hypnotically induced analgesia, just like it does for the you know, pharmacologically induced analgesia. So, so basically, any way you want to slice it or dice it, endogenously induced endorphins work exactly the same as medication induced endorphins. Okay, so you said you can control pain relief, inflammatory response. What else can you do with the placebo effect? Well, the, the one that's been the most studied and the most easily demonstrated is pain, right? Um, the, uh, the other ones that I'm aware of um, are like the uh, inflammatory response. Um, you can convince someone they're possessed by an ancient demon. Who's done that? Nobody here. <laughs> um, and there's a couple others, but, uh, um, um, and you know what, I'm just drawing a blanket. If you can do baldness, give me a call. That's why you were there. Okay, that's the uh, final question. I very much appreciate it. So, uh, <laughs> just to uh, reinforce, um, uh, I was responsible for obtaining the restaurant for this evening. 
uh, which I actually did two months ago, but I forgot that I did. <laughs> when I was informed earlier today that I needed to do that, I ran over there and I asked them if, you know, could they accommodate 30 or 40 people tonight at 530? And they said, no, uh, we already uh, have the room reserved by some needy guy. <laughs> <laughs>